Seriously? Okay. Oh. Where is it all going? Oh. Please, please, please. Yes. Oh. Why is this happening? No, buddy. No, no, buddy. No, no, buddy. Hey, honey. Are you taking things for granted again? Yeah, I guess so. All right, well, is there anything you can do about that? Because we really need to do some laundry. Laura, will you please give me a more grateful heart? Honey! My car! Gosh, man, gosh. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that it doesn't work that way, right? Because, dude, we'd be missing stuff. We'd be, we'd be missing stuff. And I'm, you know, I watched this clip, and I, I love it for a lot of reasons. I don't know if it's just the, the time of year right now, but as things are getting cooler and it's just the Colors are changing. I'm thinking about Thanksgiving. And I think we need to make sure that we don't just make Thanksgiving a one-day event a year. I think it needs to be 365 days. In fact, Scripture tells us to be thankful and be grateful in all things, even the, the rough stuff, even the bad stuff. We can thank God. Why? Because God's going to use it to make us better because He is faithful. Amen? Amen. And, and there's just so much to be reminded about when it comes to thankfulness. I think if we spend more time being grateful every day, we'll spend less time complaining. I think it's a great discipline to wake up. As soon as your feet hit the floor in the morning, just start thanking God for about 10 things, okay? Because what that will do is that will start your day on a trajectory of what God's given you, okay? And you can thank God for his faithfulness, even just starting out. I mean, it's just, it's just the way to be. James chapter 1, verse 17, it tells us that Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Amen? Everything. So how many of you guys have received something good in your life? Yeah. Okay? There's one originator. There is one source, and that is God Almighty. And so you can thank him. We need to thank him every day. You know, these videos are good for me. They help, rem they help remind me of so many things. And, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And so for me, I think a video is worth a million. So it's good stuff. God wants his message to be heard by each one of us. That's why he gives us his scripture. That's why he gave us his son. God gave us word pictures even. I, before we had video and all that stuff back in the day in the Old and the New Testaments, God would paint his truth, his amazing spiritual truth, and bring it down to our practical level using word pictures that people could understand. Um, one thing I've been meditating on recently is the, the power of the tongue, in James chapter 3. And God, James, the writer there, half-brother of Jesus, he gives us a, a word picture of the power of the tongue. He said, you know, it's just like a, a huge ship on the ocean has this small rudder that no one can see that helps steer that massive ship. In the same way, you and I have a rudder between our molars that steers our life because our words are very important. And he goes on to say in Scripture that even a, a huge forest fire is started by such a small spark, just like the power of the tongue. Or even consider the horse, a massive animal, you know, weighing so many hundreds of pounds, but it can be guided by the small metal bit in its mouth, just like the tongue in the mouth of a human. There's so many things that we need to realize because there is a correlation every day between our words and what comes out of our mouth and what is inside of our heart. 
Now, that's important for you and I as Christ followers because God resides, God lives in our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so if God is inside of us, then people around us are going to see God in our actions but also in our words. Would you agree with that? That's the truth. Now, the opposite of that is also true, meaning if you've got some heart sickness, some resentment, some bitterness, some things that are there in your heart that God wants to get out, they can only stay in there so long before they're going to fizz out through your mouth. And we need to realize there's a correlation between what is inside of a man or what's inside of a woman will be seen by the world around them. In fact, Jesus told this story in Matthew 15, verse 10. It says, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, this is what defiles them or makes them unclean. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. So you can, you can think about your heart and your words and your actions this way. There's another way that we can describe it. Think about if someone comes and visits your house, they don't know what you have in your pantry. They don't know what you have in your food cupboard, um, where you, wherever you store your food. But when you get it out of the closet and you put it on the table there, everyone can see what comes from deeper within. So it is with your heart. Your heart tells the world around you what is inside of you. It's either really good or really bad, depending upon what is inside of you, because your words are a barometer. Think about that. And the scripture tells us that in the end, the dead will be judged according to what they've done that's written in the books. Now, this is the word of God. This talks about this in the Revelation chapter 21, I believe it is. But Jesus also says when he was here in his earthly ministry, he said, we're going to have to give an account for every word, every idle word that comes out of our mouth. So that puts the fear of God in me. What, what's the message I'm giving to those around me? Is it one of uplifting and encouraging or is it one of tearing other people down? It's a biblical fact that your tongue is a barometer of what's inside of you and I. So let's hold that thought. I'm gonna start off with a few disjointed thoughts at the beginning and then we're gonna tie them together today in the sermon as we look at how God, the Savior, interacted with the unsavory of the world. But I wanna ask you a question. Um, how many of you guys have um, a remote control at your house? Anybody? Yeah. How many of you have more than one remote control? How many of you guys have like a little basket of remotes? Yes, we do too. Some for gaming consoles, some for DVD, and, and all these other um, electronic devices that we have. Well, among your remotes, wouldn't it be awesome to have a life remote where you could press pause when you said something you didn't want to say, and then you could rewind it and do it over? How many of you guys would like with those? Well, I'm selling those today after church for a church fundraiser. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I wish I had one to give you because I know I'd be tearing it up, man. I, I, all the things I've said in my life that I wish I could, could hit rewind and to change. And, and, and that would be quite the valuable tool. So why are we talking about all this this morning? You know, we started off with this video talking about being grateful to God. Then we talked about your tongue and the power of the tongue. And then out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. And then we talked about being able to change things or, or having regret for things that you've said. Well, what does all this have to do with our sermon series? Well, it actually has a lot to do with what I believe that God has, has put on our heart. Because Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago and, and he came with a message from God's heart. It wasn't enough that God could pin his message using the prophets of old. It wasn't enough that God even used angels and celestial beings from God to get his message across. God, God sent his son, Jesus, the word, capital W, the word made flesh, who made his home among us. This message was so important that God, he pulled out all the stops to make sure that humanity got the message that God was proclaiming. And, and what is that message? That message is that God is love and that he created you and I to have a relationship with him. But this thing called sin in our life that we've all been guilty of needs to go. Something has to happen. And that thing that has to happen is Jesus Christ. His blood is the best soap ever. And, and I'm really breaking this down into bite-sized pieces here. But Jesus Christ is the redeemer. He redeems your life. He cleanses your life if you will give your life to him. 
and, and Jesus came and he, he communicated God's heart of love that not only was God love, but that's what God wants for each one of us. Because the two greatest commandments is love God with all that you are and love those around you the same way. And it's not your definition of love. It's not the Beatles who say love, love, love or, or the latest song by Beyonce or whoever. It's God's definition of love that's different than man or woman's definition here on earth because God's definition of love is above all the other loves. Amen? Are y'all, are y'all trucking with me this morning? Jesus Christ came to show us that love. In fact, we've been talking about in our latest sermon series how God, Jesus, God with skin on, came and he rubbed shoulders with the world around him, the unsavory characters, even his best friend, Peter, that, that when Jesus needed him most, Peter betrayed him, said he didn't even know Jesus three times. And, and that hurt Jesus, but that didn't change God's love for Peter. What about Pontius Pilate, who literally sent Jesus to his execution? We talked about how God, Jesus, loved on Pontius Pilate. I mean, the list goes on. We could share for days about all the people that Jesus rubbed shoulders with when he was here. The Savior, perfect Savior, and how he rubbed shoulders with the unsavory. And what did he do? He truly loved them. And the reason why that's so important is because that's our mission. In fact, Jesus said, the world will know that you're my followers by one thing. Not your amount of money in your checking account, not your degree on your wall, not what the stock market tells you is in your, your, your retirement accounts, none of that. The world will know that you are God's followers by your love. That's important. It defines you and I, and it makes us everything that we are. And, and, and when I'm looking at how Jesus truly interacted with the world around him, I, I see the way that Jesus loved. Sorry. I see the way that Jesus loved, okay? And, and that's a goal of mine in my marriage and my relationships with people I know and relationships with people that I don't know. But if I'm really going to look at this, I've noticed when I think about the Savior and the unsavory, there was something else Jesus did. And, and this sermon is, is kind of more serious today. And, and that thing that Jesus did that was love in action that, that actually rubs me raw, that I don't understand, that comes across to me as really awkward, is that oftentimes Jesus would do and say things that I would never do. Jesus would say things that in our culture today would be politically incorrect, socially awkward, and culturally taboo. Yet Jesus never stopped. And, and I'm, I'm just trying to say, why is that? Why is it that Jesus would do things that I wish I had a remote for and I would press pause and say, Lord, we can't say that. I certainly wouldn't have said that. In fact, Peter being Jesus' best friend during his earthly ministry, you caught Peter oftentimes, or I say oftentimes, sometimes, pulling Jesus aside and saying pretty much, Lord, I wouldn't have said that. In fact, Peter rebuked Jesus for what Jesus said at least once. And so why did Jesus act this way? Why was Jesus going against the cultural norm to the point of coming across, if I can be honest with you, as he came across like he was hard, like he was calloused. Some would even probably say that Jesus didn't care. But what I'm realizing is he did care, and that's why he did what he did. The, the reason why Jesus said things that I wouldn't have said and you wouldn't have said was because Jesus was not here for what people wanted. Jesus was here for what people needed. And this is hitting me square on in my heart right now because can I be real with you guys I find myself wanting to put on a Christianity that is easy for people around me and for myself anybody else do that I find myself wanting to appease I'm a people pleaser sometimes and I and I want people to like me and so if I'm going to be like gut level honest with y'all, then I'm going, to, I'm going to have to say that, full disclaimer, I'm guilty. I want to say things that are easy for people around me. But Michael Miller has given his life to Jesus Christ, which means I can't do 
some of the things that I don't want to do anymore. Now, I'm not saying I'm, I'm going to be a jerk and, and that's the way it is. But, but what I am saying is that I've got to start asking myself some hard questions about who am I truly following in my life? Am I following Jesus Christ or am I following Michael Miller? Because the last time I checked, lordship means completely giving everything to God. So I have to shed this coat, this jacket of what I think in modern American Christianity thinks it, Christianity needs to look like. And I've got to put that aside and I've got to examine the scriptures and live like Jesus. I'm just, life's too short for me to fake the funk, guys. Life is too short for me to like sit up here and give you a gospel light, L-I-T-E. There's too many preachers that do that. And I'm not that guy. I, I, I've got to tell you the truth. And, and the reason why I do that is because my Savior God, Jesus Christ, he told the truth. And, and here's the crazy thing. People left him. People left him because he told them the truth. And he wasn't worried. He didn't go running after them. What? And the reason why I'm realizing more and more is that Jesus was not here for what the people wanted. Jesus was here for what the people needed. Now let's go a little deeper with that practically. You and I. Because Jesus knew the difference between wants and needs. And we live in a culture that doesn't. We live in a culture that is upside down and Jesus Christ came to make it right side up. Like you and I, Jesus was immersed and inserted in a culture that had its wants and its needs confused. Think about your culture. Assess your culture with me right now. We are drowning just, just off the top of my head. I can think about this. We are drowning in a sea of overconsumption. Gross consumerism selfishness, and affluence. Why? Because that is what our culture wants. We live and we are immersed in a culture of entertainment over the essential. Why? Because that is what we want. You know, Angela, my wife and I, the other day we were talking about, you know, I'm sure NFL football players and, and soccer players and, and these amazing athletes, they work really hard, okay? But why is it that they make more money in their lifetime than they can ever spend if they live decently and appropriately? They make more multi-million dollars than they can ever spend. And we have people right now in our community, policemen, for example, that are giving their lives, literally, and they can barely make ends meet financially. Does anybody else wonder that? Am I the only one who thinks about that? I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? I mean, and we live in a culture where some people are talking about even defunding them. I'm like, are you kidding me, McFly? What are you doing? It's craziness. And, and there's an incongruence there. I don't understand that. I mean, so I'm married to a teacher, kind of a little teacher education plug here. I had no idea what all teachers did until I was married to one. And as awesome as our teachers are, oftentimes they barely make enough. But these NFL football players or these movie stars that are actually what they're doing, an actor is living someone else's fake life. Y'all know that, right? And I'm not saying they're not amazing actors. They're, they're awesome actors, and I think they're cool. But do they really need to make all that dough when we have people that are essential to the fabric of our culture that are doing everything they can, and they're still not making ends meet? It just doesn't make sense to me. Why is that? Because we live in a culture of entertainment, because we have got our priorities mismatched. We live in a culture of if it feels good, do it, no matter the personal or global or public or private consequences. Why? Because that is what we want. Jesus turned culture upside down. And Jesus came with a really different message. He said, deny yourself. Lose yourself for God and others so that you will be found. Jesus had a completely different message to the world around us. You see, one of Jesus' main jobs was to reveal, to reveal who God was to the world. And guess what your job is? To reveal who God is to the world. 
And if you're not doing it right, and if you're drinking the Kool-Aid of the world, and they're looking at you and saying, that's how a Christian acts, do you really think you're bearing the image of God? You're not. There's a breakdown in the system. Jesus Christ came, and, and Scripture says in Colossians 2, 9 and 10, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So the Bible tells us that not only was all of God inside of Jesus' human frame, but Jesus, the Son of God, is the image. He's what God looks like. He's the image of the invisible God, it says in Colossians 1, 15. So Jesus Christ, once again, he came to show us who God is and what God does. So listen to me. This is important that you hear this because oftentimes what I'm fixing to tell you gets lost in translation. Although Jesus came for us, he was not here for us. Jesus was here for the Father. Jesus makes this clear in John chapter 6, verses 38 through 39. This is not my message. Everything I'm preaching is God's message. So once again, Jesus, although he came for us, he came to save us, Jesus came for us, he was not here for us. You see, Jesus had his priorities always in order. The Father's will was always Jesus' priority, not our will, not even Jesus' wants. I mean, he went to the cross and he's like, Father, this is gonna hurt. Putting nails in my my hands and my wrists and in my feet, this, I don't wanna do this, but... Not my will, thy will be done. This is going to kill me. But Father, this is what you want. And we're not here for my wants. We're here for the needs. And I'll give my life to you. Jesus was not here for what we wanted. Jesus was here for what we needed. And Jesus understood the difference between wants and needs. And Jesus knew that a wrong priority here and a little wrong priority there, these wrong priorities add up to create a backwards global culture that we are now living in. Wrong priorities. Now, I'm grateful for you guys because y'all are here this morning. Y'all are at church. Raise your hand if you're here at church this morning. You should all be doing that. You're all here, by the way. Okay, good, good. All right. But, but there's, there's these little things that Satan tries to, 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 to kill you. Satan's trying to kill you, guys. Jesus said that. He said the thief, Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan wants to kill you, and, and he realizes the little things can kill you just as much as the big things. By the way, if you Google the most dangerous animal on the planet, it's not the tiger you're scared of or the shark. It's a mosquito. Something so small, something so small, that you barely even think about it. But it kills far more millions of people every year than the things you're scared about in your nightmares. That's just one small example of how Satan will use a small single cell of sin that will metastasize and devour the host. We need each other, amen? God knows that, so he gave you a herd of heroes called the church. Because he knows that you can't do it alone. I can't do it alone. Church is not just something that you go to. You be the church. You don't go to church. You are the church. You are the force that God has empowered with his very spirit to change the world. And God is counting on you and I. But to do that, we have to have our priorities in line with his. We all are called to God-sized things. Jesus Christ was here, and he came to do what we needed, namely the salvation of our souls and the reconciliation of humans back to God through redemption. And in this divine process, because Jesus did not live for us, because Jesus lives for the Father, he did things differently, things that did not make sense to the culture around him. Because he was not here, listen to me, Jesus was not here to do things sensibly, he was here to do things obediently. Do you live for common sense? Is that your God? Or do you live to be obedient to the Father? Because there were times when there was a divergence, when sensibility went this way and Jesus went that way, because obedience required it. Francis Chan says it this way, something is wrong when our lives make sense to unbelievers. Something is wrong with the church when our lives make sense to unbelievers. If you're fitting in and that's your goal and that's your God, you're on the wrong train, brother. Jesus lived this. This is not some pie in the sky thing that Jesus did not live. He lived this 
Case in point, when Jesus told someone to follow him and that guy began to make excuses, even good worldly excuses, like Jesus, I will first, I would like to follow you, but first I need to bury my dad that just died, which that sounds like a great excuse to me. But Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Like in our sermon scripture text today, in Matthew 8, 18 through 22, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man is homeless. The son of man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. And we see the exact same dialogue perhaps in Luke chapter 9 when it says, as they were walking along the road, the man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. So essentially, this is what happened. Jesus was walking down the road, and I bet this happened regularly to Jesus. He's walking down the road, and someone says, I'll follow you wherever you go, Lord. And Jesus turned to him and said, I'm homeless, and you will be too if you follow me. Jesus told another guy, follow me. And the guy said, okay, Lord, but first I've got to bury my dad who just died. And Jesus said, you ain't got time for that. He's already dead. You need to lead the living to Christ now. And then finally, a guy said, Lord, I'm going to follow you, but first I've got to tell my family bye-bye. I've got to tell my wife where I'm going. And Jesus said, me or them, you choose. Now, that's hard, guys. I'll be honest with you. If I really, if I really start practicing this message, you may fire me as your pastor. Straight up. I mean, if someone, I, I get called on regularly to do funerals. And I've never told somebody, no, let the dead bury the dead. Do you know how much that family would chew me out if I said that to them? They would say how insensitive you are. But that's what Jesus did, right? And don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we're called to be obnoxious jerks, amen? We've got to operate with the love and the compassion and the mercy of Jesus Christ, which is kind of scary sometimes. All I'm saying is, who are you living for, guys? What coat are you wearing? Are you wearing your coat or Christ's coat? Because this world's getting crazier by the minute. And God is counting on you and I to change this world. And we can't do it if we're infected with the world. If we smell like the world's cologne because we've been sleeping with the world, what is that going to say about the witness and character of Christ who died to the world? How is it that Jesus said what he said? Why is it that Jesus did what he did that was so socially incorrect? Because Jesus knew this place was not our home. That's how he did it. Jesus knew that we had, the, the, the church, that the, the people who were trying to follow God, that we had moved into the world and put up curtains and put lipstick on the pig of this world. And we were trying to make this world look good. And Jesus was like, guys, I'm just passing through here. You're living here. This is wrong. This is not our home. You were destined for something called heaven. And this ain't heaven. It's broken. It's about thy kingdom come. Jesus Christ came to remind us what life is about. It's about our Father. It's not my kingdom come. It's not my will be done. It's not my, I'm going to live here the best I can and be self-preserved and, and hibernate in my own little cocoon. No, it's giving your life to the world around you. Is doing things that are unsensible, unsensibly loving, radically merciful, uncharacteristically dying to self. Jesus Christ came with the truth of what we needed, not what we wanted, and we killed him for it. So for you to be the savior for the unsavory on your street, you've got to stop living for yourself, church. Because when you start living for the Father, you will love people on your street, not just the way they want, but sometimes, more importantly, the way they need. Which, I'll be honest with you, 
Tough love hurts sometimes. Tough love hurts sometimes, but it can save a soul. And here's the deal. You don't live for the world anymore anyway. If you do, the scripture says you're not a Christian. Love not the world. It's really clear. Jesus says you can't you can't have two masters. It's your time to choose. And here's the deal. God's given us this church. My coat's leaving. God's given us this, this church as a safe place where we can work this out together, amen? Where we can say, hey man, I need some help with this because I really love the flesh. I need some help with this, brother. Can you pray for me? That's why I was 6 a.m. at a brother's house this week with three other guys, four other guys, and we were spilling our guts with each other, being real with our Christian walk about what God is saying to us about how we can be better husbands to our wives. Can I get an amen? Amen. How we can truly let go of the lust of this world in a confidential environment where we love each other. And we're, man, I got your back, bro. I'm praying for you, man. I need that. You need that. We need life together called the church because we don't live for the world anymore. This is the message the Savior preached. And this is the message that our Savior lived. If, if I'm wrong, if you think I'm wrong, you show me in Scripture where I'm wrong. I am called to not just preach and proclaim, but to live the truth of Jesus Christ, just like you. Amen? So what are we waiting on? Let us pray. Lord God, thank you that this is your heart, God. This is the way you live, Jesus Christ. This is the, your witness to the world. Lord, help us as your church to not live divided to not live for the world on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and for, the, for you on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and, and, and live for somebody else on Sunday. God, help us to be truly authentic in our life to realize that we're here not for what the world wants but for what the world needs. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, amen. I want to invite you to stand with me as we close today. This is a time when we respond. This is not a time to think about what you're going to eat for lunch. Amen? This is a time when we clue in and say, Holy Spirit, use me. You can come to the altar and kneel. Maybe you need to give your life to Christ. Maybe you need to recommit your life. I'm here for you. If you would like prayer, put your hands out. We'd love to to pray with you. Leah's here this morning. It's good to have him back and Whitney. But we're here for you. Just put your hands out. That means that you would like prayer. Or maybe you just want to come and just do business with the Lord. Whatever it is, God bless you as you're led by the Holy Spirit. Amen, church? Amen. God bless you as you come.